Okay, so again, uh, I'm Doug Adler. Uh, I'm a writer with Aviation History Magazine, and I'm incredibly honored to be joined by uh, astronaut Fred Hayes, known to the world uh, for his role as the Lunar Module Pilot in Apollo 13. Fred, thank you so much for joining. This is just terrific. I'm glad, glad to join you. Glad to join a fellow aviator. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm one of those people, and I'm sure you run across a lot of them, who has found deep and lasting inspiration from Project Apollo, really from my childhood up to and including today. And I'm a physician, but I, I often find ways to take lessons from Project Apollo and use them in my life when it comes to overcoming adversity and solving complex problems. Um, so the, the first question I have is, you know, obviously you're known around the world uh, as an astronaut, but you know, I'm reading your recent autobiography, uh, Never Panic Early, one gets the impression that you view yourself really first and foremost as a pilot and, and an astronaut second. Would you agree with that? That was kind of my impression on reading the book. Yeah, I think all of us at that uh, time, we were primarily uh, former military pilots. Uh, most of us had been in the astronaut business uh, in the, uh, with air aircraft tests. And then uh, so from that, we joined the astronaut program. So, you know, our primary uh, livelihood for years had been uh, with airplanes. And uh, it really, to me, I, people don't realize, I think space is something extra special. But uh, spacecraft is just an airplane with a few different kind of subsystems uh, because it operates in a different environment. And it had rocket engines versus a jet engine. And so the, the practice you do, although I have to say Apollo was a huge program with 400,000 people at peak. Uh, so it was bigger than most aircraft test programs I was involved with as far as the number of players. But the, the principles uh, involved were all the same. Uh, it, it obviously had an endpoint in Apollo that was pretty exciting. Think about going to the moon. Uh, but other than that, I, I, to me, it was people don't understand it, but to me, it was just another exciting adventure. You know, I'm reading the book. Uh, you know, your tone in the book changes at different parts, of, as you describe different parts or events in your life. And the section about your initial flight training as a very young man, your early naval flight assignments, it's, it's written with an extreme degree of enthusiasm. And the amount of detail you remember about this period is extremely impressive for me on, as a reader. You know, I kind of got the sense that, and I was curious if I was right, that was this the most enjoyable period of your time as a pilot, those initial few years where you were really going from a non-pilot to, to a pilot flying a lot of new aircraft for the first time. No, I, no, I'd have to say the most fun time uh, of my career was when I was at uh, NASA uh, Flight Research Center, now named Armstrong at Edwards uh, as a NASA test pilot. And because I was involved in so, in so, many, so many different things. Uh, and the, I probably was involved in three test programs at any given time, sometime only the prime pilot in one test program, I'd be uh, one of the evaluation pilots uh, for handling qualities or something like that on another test program going on. And then I did support flying a lot for the X-15 that was going on at that time, either be a chase or do the weather morning weather checks or go check the upper range lake beds ahead of time and uh, see that they were safe if they had to drop in early and check telemetry stations upper range at Beatty and Ely, that kind of thing. So. Probably flying uh, uh, not not every day twice, but sometimes twice a day, but almost flying every day. And I imagine that flying at Edwards in that period, you must have felt like you're at the absolute peak of the flying game. It was yeah, it was right at the end of what I call the golden era of uh, aviation test at Edwards. You know, when you were at Edwards, you know, you were alongside many many notables: Joe Walker, Bruce Peterson, and of course. Chuck Yeager, um, you know, you mentioned in the book, obviously that it was when you were at Edwards that you decided to apply to NASA to become an astronaut. Did you think you had a good choice, or sorry, a good chance of being accepted, or did you think it was a long shot? No, I, th I thought I had a good chance. I had done, call it my servitude and getting the background experience. Uh, my resume I thought was solid. 
Uh, I uh, have had to think hard about uh, applying. I almost uh, really thought several times what I should do that and leave the good flying I was doing because Neil, Neil Armstrong, who was ahead of me about three years with NASA, he joined at Lewis Research Center ahead of me and then he went to uh, Flight Research Center and then on into the astronaut program came back and described his uh, his job as an astronaut as uh, sitting in a lot of meetings, sitting in a simulator, a lot, lots and lots of hours, and not much good flying. Mm. So that was Neil's description of being an astronaut, which is pretty close to being right. And so I had to think uh, hard about leaving all this good flying and uh, joining the astronaut program. But uh, the thought of getting to the moon was uh, overpowering. So that's why I did. You know, in, in the book, I get the sense that uh, you wish you'd had a chance to fly the X-15. Yes. Yeah, the X-15 is the last uh, vehicle, space vehicle, that the pilot has manually controlled uh, the flight from the time they released from the B-52. They did, they did the, got the engine going uh, very quickly, had to do a very critical and uh, accurate uh, pull up to a certain uh, attitude that basically reflected the profile that we're going to fly, just as a rocket has to get to the ascent uh, attitudes to go to orbit. And so all manual, uh, there's no autopilot in the next 15. And then they had to change somewhat the, the flight control if they went up high over the top because the aerodynamic controls were no longer active. So they had to use a little uh, rocket Rocks. Gas, uh, gas rockets to control attitude, and then the setup for a very critical enter entry to be set up with the right uh, angle of attack and uh, attitude to, uh, when they came back into the atmosphere, where again, they were going fast enough, there was uh, heating to deal with, and uh, manually all the way through that and setting up and controlling through the entry, then to come out of that at the bottom and from a navigation standpoint to arrive back over at Edwards and do a circular kind of an approach overhead to affect a uh, landing all manual at Edwards with an L over D of about a, a four and a half, but same as shuttle. So it's ma a manual vehicle, see, in, 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 a, in the rocket business, uh, Mercury on, nobody has ever flown an asset. Right. All the, all the pilots, I uh, should say pilots, astronauts could do in the aborts, but that was, that was the, so the extent of their capability, you just hope, we all hope this rocket had been prepared right and it was full of gas and uh, would get us up there. But uh, you were along for the ride. You monitored, of course, uh, how it was doing on the way up, should you have to abort. Uh, but there was no manual control at all uh, through uh, all the ascents. Things were happening too fast. Right. You know, uh... There's many, many astronaut autobiographies, and I have to confess to you, I think without hyperbole, I've probably read them all. Uh, and, and many of the astronaut autobiographies have commented that Chuck Yeager was maybe less than enthusiastic about losing people from Edwards to NASA. What was your experience with him overall and in that regard? No, I never saw that in Chuck. Uh, he was... Uh... He was obviously a, a commandant of the test pilot school when I went through uh, for a year. And if, uh, as you know from the book, I, w I shouldn't have gone through the second half of the school. Hmm. Uh, I was the first civilian ever to go through the second half. Chuck uh, arranged that. Actually, he didn't arrange it. He said, let's just come on and I'll get into school. And uh, somewhere down the road, he decided he'd tell the Pentagon people that he had done that. And so I got to go through the whole year rather than the first six months, which normally test pilots who were there just as test pilots would do. And so he was very gracious that way. Uh, I, fl I flew with him and I described that in the book because I did a little showing off uh, while I had Chuck uh, beside me there in the airplane while he, we were chasing a lifting body. Right. Yeah, you talked about how you were you you told him you were worried about overstressing uh, the engine a little bit, so you shut it down. Correct. Right. No, I was. Yeah, I, I it was the, uh, uh, the the I didn't want to, uh, the batteries we had were the older uh, S S acetate batteries, 
rather than the newer one. So I, I just kiddingly said I didn't want to stress the batteries. How is that received? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the book is titled Never Panic Early. Um, maybe you could sort of say broadly, you know, what that phrase means to you, because I imagine most readers haven't heard that. And, and where did it come from? Did you come up with it or did someone else come up with it? Mm. Oh, I came up with it, but I, I think it deals with uh, everyday things for people uh, in, in their home. If their child has all at once a problem, an accident or something, uh, they have to mentally go through a process of figuring out what's the best thing to do. In some cases, do I, do I call a 911 first or get an ambulance or call, ask for help from a neighbor? Or I, what do I, I try to patch the child up in some way myself? So on occasion, there's occasions for people that have that same dilemma of uh, trying to think through the situation uh, and all the options they might have of what to do. And primarily don't do anything too quickly where you might do the wrong thing. And, and things first. Or panic early has served you well in a variety of situations. Absolutely, yeah. It, uh, I always have experienced that in airplanes where you have a system problem and rather than throw any switches or do anything, you normally will study the instrument panel and think about your knowledge about the system and uh, what, what if it's real or not, for sure, uh, that's not something false. And then next is the procedures on uh, that, if you know the system and the uh, emergency procedures are now function procedures on what steps you now should take. In, in medicine, there's a phrase that I use sometimes that's sort of similar to the idea that, you know, you want to take a few moments and, and think before you act. And, and then the phrase that I often exactly. use is, uh, don't just do something, stand there. Exactly. Yeah. Just like, because your first impulse may not be right. And your first impulse may make the situation worse until you've really had maybe just 10 or 30 seconds to assess it. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, most astronaut biographies uh, describe the astronaut office in Houston, to put it mildly, as an extremely competitive environment. Uh, your book didn't really do this. It was sort of, it was sort of unique in my experience. Uh, when you were there in the astronaut office in, in Houston, what was your experience like working with the astronauts? I mean, obviously everybody was competing and jockeying for flight assignments. Uh, what was it like for you? No, I didn't find that uh, at all, my, my, at least among the group, uh, the original 19 <laughs> that we were chosen in 1966. Uh, frankly, I wasn't in the office that much mm -hmm. uh, initially because after our rookie training that went on, uh, supposed to go on, I think it was originally 12 months or 15 months, uh, they cut us short at about uh, nine months because we got support crew assignments. There was so much work and cuts up to cover. And I got assigned to follow the lunar module and, uh, and testing at Grumman and I and Ed Mitchell. And we were up there for a, a good part of uh, a little more than a year. So I wasn't, I wasn't back in the office to uh, uh, see, see people that much anyway. And I was, I was just off on a mission for Jim McDivitt uh, that we were dispatched to make sure he had a good lunar module to fly when he flew Apollo 9 with limb three. Although we tested, I was in the, from limb two through limb six, I was in those vehicles from the first time we put power on uh, and, and getting those ready to get ready to go to Cape. So I wonder if maybe you're, the fact that you were up at Grumman and Beth Page for so long maybe spared you some of the more, some of the most tense experiences that a lot of the other astronauts write about in their books. Yeah, no, I didn't, I never felt a competition. I, I have obviously didn't know and hoped I'd be uh, chosen early, but I had no idea. And <clears throat> none of us knew how exactly the, the process was gonna be in selecting who would get what missions and when. We knew obviously Deke Slayton and Al Shepard were at the front end of that. Uh, and uh, as it turned out later, we found out they, that whatever they did, which I guess was rubber stamp, most of the time was actually sent to headquarters before any announcement of, of that. 
you know, just to just to touch base on Apollo 13 briefly, uh, you know, in the book, you give the reader a fair bit of credit for largely knowing the story. I mean, I imagine most people who are going to read your book are pretty familiar with the story of Apollo 13 already. You know, I've always been curious about life after the mission. What was it like to return to the astronaut office after coming back from that? You know, did you, okay. you and Jack Swigert stay close? Were you close to Jim Lovell after the mission? What was it like to come back after such an such a harrowing experience? Right. Well, uh, we of course we had public affairs events. In fact, we made the first State Department. Well, that's sort of a quarter world tour through uh, Iceland, Ireland, uh, Germany, Switzerland, and the first official group to go into Greece. That was after the colonel had overtaken the country and kicked her all the way out. And so we had, we had we're tied up with that, although within uh, about a month or six weeks, Deke called me in and I had a, my next job assignment. Uh, uh, I knew, and I knew it, and that we were gonna be, uh, I was gonna be the backup commander for Apollo 16. So for me, it was just back in crew training, <laughs> crew training again as soon as I got rid of the public affairs business uh, with Jerry Carr and uh, Bill Pogue. And your backup position on Apollo 16 puts you in a prime slot for Apollo 19 had it occurred. Had it occurred, that's right. You know, after... Um, after your flight training in your early years as a pilot, one of the one of the sections of the book that you really discuss with a lot of excitement are the approach and landing test, the captive and free flights that use the space shuttle Enterprise before the initial launch of Columbia. I was a grade schooler at the time that those flights occurred, and I remember them very vividly and followed them very closely in the media. You know, these tests were absolutely vital to the success of the shuttle program, but I think you know, in 2022, a lot of people may not be aware of those tests or remember them. You know, how does it feel looking back on the ALT test today as the essentially the de facto first person to ever land a space shuttle? Well, I, I was, uh, I look back at it as really the highlight of my career. Uh, uh, you see, uh, before I uh, got involved in the assigned as a crew, I had spent four years in the Orbiter Project Office. So I was in management in essence, and I was uh, following the design development of that orbiter that was in the orbiter project office. <clears throat> so I was kind of a wound the tomb experience because actually I was on a, a group that evaluated the proposals for who submitted the co companies that submitted those to pick even who would build the shuttle, hmm. uh, which I didn't advertise much yeah, later. At, yeah, right. but but anyway, so I was there from day one on uh, space shuttle orbiter, at least involvement, and then get to fly it the, the first time. It was a it was a program also that was off to the side of the major program. In other words, we were given limited uh, uh, assets. Uh, Deke Slayton, uh, uh, greatly I appreciated, actually left his position and became the test director. So we were, really, it was back to an aircraft flight test program at Edwards. And uh, he had an accomplice, uh, it's the number two guy that had been in the Edwards flight test before in his career. We had a good team that came out from Kennedy early, which they'd never done before. They always sent a few people to the factory previously on vehicles and witnessed some tests, but they never had hands on until the vehicle got to Kennedy. But uh, I talked them into going early on this one to get some experience and they did. We had the very best of Kennedy. And we had the top Rockwell team that was left over from Apollo days of test conductors and test engineers. So we had a grade A team, but a very small nucleus set off while the rest of the world was worrying about how to go to orbit mm -hmm. in Columbia. So it's kind of a neat program in that sense. Uh, we were off to ourselves. We had two support crew members assigned, Bob uh, Bobco and uh, Obermeyer, mm -hmm. Bob Obermeyer. And we actually had to borrow some talent, uh, uh, steal some talent with uh, uh, others to help with the software job, which is the biggest job, uh, prob most problem to get ready, uh, to get it fine. Uh, Enterprise was also a, a big programmatic uh, thing for, the, for NASA at the time. As we went into that program, NASA had, had, uh, had to announce a, a several year slip in the orbital flight because of tile problem. Mm -hmm. 
Right. We also faced a new president having Kevin come in. That wasn't his program. It was Nixon's program. And uh, President Carter had come in. And so we worried about those aspects uh, with, with, that we had no backup. We had a, se a second uh, enterprise uh, when we started the program, but quickly for cost, what the program costs were cut early, we deleted it. So we had no backup vehicle. But you don't like the sit. You don't like that situation in the test program. And 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 uh, there was obviously time pressure because at the time there was potential hope of saving Skylab. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Skylab was you know created a void actually because it flew in seventy five, and uh, first orbital flight at that time, uh, early on was I forget when it was predicted. So initially, I think seventy nine, and they had to acknowledge that slip till eighty one. Um, you know, you said something that I, I thought was really striking in the book, right? So obviously the space shuttle is carried aloft aboard a modified 747. And you said that the flight when, for example, when the shuttle was released was actually more dangerous to the, the crew of the 747. Absolutely. Yeah. Could you, they could had you no escape on that a little bit? Yeah. The, the, yeah, we were on top of the 747 and even had we gone out of control at release, had we damaged the 747, uh, that crew could not have gotten out. They had no escape system, whereas myself and Gardo Fullerton, we were sitting in ejection seats. So we had a plan B that hopefully would have enabled us to survive. But Fitz Fulton and Tom McMurtry and Vic Harton and Skip Guidry would have all died had we uh, seriously damaged that 747. Yeah, I read quite a lot about the ALT program, but that was something I'd never heard before. Um, one last question. You know, uh, unfortunately, NASA's Artemis program seems to be creeping forward at a, a pretty slow pace these days, whereas SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, and the other private space programs are making rapid progress. What are your thoughts on private space flight? Well, pr private spaceflight, for the most part, at least uh, SpaceX, is uh, quite mature, uh, particularly at this point. So they're they're almost able to live off uh, the income earned, including what NASA pays them for for rides. And uh, the the uh, the rest of Artemis uh, NASA has to deal with still is depending on the same old problem of getting the budgets cleared through the subcommittee and mainly the houses. <clears throat> always been the bigger problem for NASA to deal with because it's such a big change out of people. Every, uh, well, they coming up as a midterm and there'll be a lot of new people that NASA, you know, has never dealt with before and now entering those committees to call it uh, re-educate about what Artemis is all about and why it's worthwhile. And, uh, but truly NASA has never had a program with the same, I'll call it national level impetus administration and Congress combined as Apollo had. There's, there's never been another program like that. Congressional, political, presidential backing all at once. Right. Yeah, it, it's, I've written a fair bit about private space flight and it's, it's been very impressive to see how quick they've moved, especially SpaceX and SpaceX is now looking at, you know, they're, they're very far along with their heavy lift boosters. So right. It'll be very exciting to see where that goes, I think. Yeah, no, it's an incredible number of launches they've done, and and I like their reuse. They've landed, and uh, I forget one booster's uh, flown the, the first stage is flown. I don't know five or six times. Extremely impressive, but it really shows you that the, I, I think a lot of people scoffed at private space flight, and I think now nobody can scoff at it. Yeah. Well, way back when I know some of the astronauts went up and and made a, a plea at the Congress. The plea was misunderstood, though, and the press took it wrong. <clears throat> what, what happened was on those the initial funding that was done, uh, which was needed because SpaceX had problems early on, had a couple of failures, and they were about running out of worthwhile money to employ if it, that continued. And NASA uh, gave them, I forget how many, a billion plus. And what Neil, I think, in uh, Cernan, I think Lovell even went to uh, testify. 
what, what they had done though, is they, they gave that money to SpaceX, which was rightful, but they made NASA eat it. In other words, they made NASA take it out of the rest of the budget. In other words, they didn't give them, give them a Delta in their, in their budget to, uh, to take care of that. And that's what I think they were complaining about because it not, didn't just ba ba impact the uh, manned space part, it also impacted some of the unmanned uh, programs that had a program plan based on cer certain funding levels, uh, annual funding levels. So it kind of set them back too. And it caused a bit of a dust up, although I think Cernan walked back a lot of the comments. Yeah. Well, no, I, I don't think they thought there'd be a failure. I don't think there was any, I don't, I, at least I don't think, I think the main argument they had was they should have given NASA the Delta budget that they then could uh, given to SpaceX to get uh, started and start going there. Uh, it's very interesting. Well, I think we'll all continue to watch it with great interest. Um, Fred Hayes, I wanna thank you for taking the time to do this interview again uh, to the viewers. Fred's book, uh, his autobiography, Never Panic Early, is out in hardcover now. And uh, there's a formal review of the book in uh, Aviation History Magazine by myself as well. Fred, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And fly safe. I'll try. Thank you.